I've once heard it said that there are only two kinds of people in the world. The first wakes up every morning and says, it's morning, Lord, good morning, Lord. The other wakes up and says, oh, Lord, it's morning. <laughs> Um, dealing with the latter kind of negativity is one of the themes that we have in unity during Lent. It always is at unity, and it is very, very freeing, getting rid of our negativity. Part of the process is just developing gratefulness, really, when you think about it, for all that we have been given in this life, food and home and comfort that millions of people in the world do not have. Freeing ourselves of negativity can, of course, reduce stress and depression and many diseases, even cancer. We were meant to enjoy life. We were meant not to suffer in this world. And the truth of the matter is that the difference between these points of view, good morning, Lord, and oh, Lord, it's morning, has nothing to do with what is going on out there. It has everything to do with our mind's eye. So let's talk a little bit today about the mind's eye. Just imagine for a moment that some being from Mars or some other planet, maybe some E.T. type creature. How many of you all have seen E.T.? Thank goodness, I just referred to that in my class this week and nobody had seen E.T. <laughs> imagine that some E.T. type figure came up to you and said, how do you Earth beings see? You would probably answer, well, we see through these eyes here. But that's not really true. We don't see through our eyes. We see with our minds. Our physical eyes are able to detect light rays, of course, that are reflected off of certain forms that are out there. Our eyes perceive these images, but only the mind makes sense of these images. The mind creates any pattern or meaning to what the eyes have perceived that's out there. The eyes are like fingers when we touch objects out there. They create sensory input to the brain, but it's the mind that decodes that input and gives it all its meaning. You might remember the Zen story of the blind monks who were trying to figure out what an elephant was. Uh, one monk went up to the elephant and felt its leg and said, oh, an elephant, it, it's just like a tree. And then another blind monk went up and felt its tail. And he said, no, no, you're wrong, an elephant, it's, it's like a broom. The third blind monk went up and felt all along the side of the elephant and declared, nope, you both got it wrong, an elephant is just like a wall and so on. Our mind's eye is like that. It creates an illusory reality of the world because we're often blind to what is really there. We think our mental perceptions are reality. Have you ever looked at the French Impressionist paintings up close uh, using the technique of plantillism? The plantillism technique, have any of you seen? Great, I know you have, Shay. <laughs> the whole painting is just a bunch of colored dots on the canvas, thus the term plantillism. They're just a lot of colored points. So up close, these paintings look like a bunch of random colored dots, and you just see these splashes of color. But when you step back, you can make out images, faces, and flowers, and plants, and so forth, because the different colors of dots together create the different images, which you can see when you step back. But you have to step back to see these images. It's somewhat the same with seeing life out there. There is a difference between looking and really seeing. Looking is simply receiving the reflected light. Seeing is changing our perspective. As in the case of a plantillism painting, we have to readjust. 
in the case of the plantillism painting, we have to step back. What we see out there is energy in certain configurations. What we perceive from that energy is what we call form, based on the energy, speed, configuration, density, etc. What we really see, though, is in our minds. Patterns in our inner minds that we project out there onto the world. What we see is not out there as much as it is in here. We are seeing a reflection of thought patterns out there, our thought patterns that we project, and then we see that reflection. And the, but the images were originally in our own minds. Remember the old example of the Rorschach inkblot test? We've talked about that before. You look at an inkblot and it doesn't look much like anything. Then the psychologist will ask you what you see. It's nothing but a blot of ink. That's it. But the psychologist is trying to determine what images are in your mind. The whole world is an inkblot test. It's what's in our mind that makes sense out of it and that we see patterns in our mind and then we project those patterns from our mind onto the world. Dr. Morris Massey, former assistant dean of the business school at the University of Colorado in Boulder, once wrote a book entitled, What You Are Is Where You Were When. Anybody read that? Interesting, okay. Uh, used to be required for almost every major business. Uh, you had to read it or see his film on it your first day. And all four branches of the armed forces, by the way. His whole thesis was that what we are, how we perceive life and how we interpret everything is based on when and where we were first programmed. Dr. Massey made millions of dollars, by the way, working with big businesses in all four branches of the armed forces because he showed why certain people couldn't work together and would get negative if they did and how that negativity developed within the workforce. He explained why many of these employees had so much trouble getting along and thereby it reduced job production. Their negativity was costing the organizations millions of dollars a year, not only in job production, but in sick leave because of their negativity and the stress and the resulting diseases. Dr. Massey showed how these workers were all constantly projecting their stuff onto each other and the projects that they were involved in. For example, Dr. Massey was programmed in the 1950s in Waco, Texas in the heart of the provincial, conservative, fundamental Baptist Bible Belt. Massey said that if a company manager had a project, like in some advertising project, for example, and he needed to get it done, and he paired uh, Dr. Massey, who's 60-something, with a man uh, who is from, say, New York City, some Jewish boy, very young, maybe Ivy League educated, and those two are paired together to work on this project to advertise something, that there would be all kinds of clashes and negativity because these two people would perceive the world and other people's motivations to buy their products, for example, very differently. Their interpretation of reality and which approach to take in advertising their product would be incredibly different. As you can imagine, both workers would experience a great deal of negativity and stress and the productivity would plummet. That example is an extreme, of course, but it's typical of what we all deal with every day in various ways. Now, Dr. Massey's reasons for studying the mind's eye was very utilitarian and applicable to the business world, but it's very helpful nonetheless to look at this phenomenon of how we interpret the world out there and often respond to it negatively due to our stuff, our programming and conditioning. 
We are where we were when, as he said, where we were when our mind's eye got conditioned initially. <clears throat> this idea of how seeing is done primarily through the mind's eye is not a new concept at all. Of course, it's been known by many people in many fields for a very long time. William Shakespeare said in his play, Julius Caesar, my favorite, by the way, the eye sees not itself, but by reflection of some other thing. Those some other things are the concepts in our mind, of course. Even on the relative plane, though, our physical eyes see only a very limited part of the light spectrum that's out there, a very narrow band. And when we perceive something in the so-called outer world, we're not even seeing what's really there anyway. We are simply seeing what we're able, with our human eyes, to pick up. We are seeing only a narrow strip of the light spectrum out there, out of the total possibility of what's there. Kind of like the blind monk only being able to be aware of the elephant's tail and thinking that elephants were just brooms. Now imagine if that monk had grabbed the elephant's tail hard so he could go in with it and sweep the monk's dining room what would possibly have ensued is a very angry elephant's wrath. And the poor monk would have been totally bewildered with this ensuing chaos. And I understand uh, that elephants can be quite violent. Well, that's often us. We project our stuff onto life and others. It sometimes doesn't correspond to reality at all, and then something stressful or catastrophic develops, and we get all negative about it. Sometimes we only notice a small part of the world, too, that we can see whatever part of the world fits into our interests or our mind's eye. It's sort of like taking a two-hour movie and looking at 15 or 20 frames and then saying, oh yeah, I know what that movie's all about. We do much the same thing with our lives. We respond not to what's really there, but to what is in here. Our physical, mental, and emotional responses throughout life are not to the world as it is, but to our interpretation of it. It's like the Eskimos, you know, who have 50, I've heard 800, but uh, apparently it's just 50 words for snow because they really perceive 50 different kinds of snow, whereas we only perceive snow or not snow. We just see a limited part of what really is out there at best. Another example, imagine that you're walking through the woods at twilight and your path goes around a corner and suddenly you see this great big bear standing there on the path. You're probably going to respond with fear. Your heart beats faster, your blood pressure rises, and your muscles say, let's get out of here. You go into flight syndrome. Then later in life, you're walking on that same path years later at your parents' home, and you go around that same corner, and you see not a bear, but the shadow of a tree in the same place. Will you respond with fear? Probably. Meeting up with that bear the first time represents many of our childhood traumas and experiences that cause us to form opinions that we later project onto the shadows and trees of our lives. Someone says something and we feel negativity, but it's not what they said that causes us to respond with stress and fear. It's the image that's in here. Maybe they remind you of when an older sibling or a friend or parent said maybe you were dumb, and then you interpret your boss's or friend's suggestion as criticism, an attack on you, your ego, and then you have a very negative response, fear, anger, depression, whatever, it's all negativity. 
One of the most obvious uh, examples of this is in the case of dreams. We've all had dreams. Dreams are proof that we don't need our physical eyes to see because we see every night with our eyes closed. In the dream state, we see images in our mind and our bodies respond to those images exactly the same as if we were awake looking at them. Have you ever had an intense dream and then you wake up and maybe your palms are sweating and you feel really uptight? Maybe you were even mad at your spouse for something that they did in your dream? That happened to me. People scream during their dreams. They sweat. They even have heart attacks because of their response to dream images. Those images become real to us as we're asleep. But we are creating our own dreams all the time when we're awake. Have you ever looked at a certain photograph and suddenly it brings back a stream of memories? You might get happy or sad or mad to someone outside the family. Those same photos are meaningless. Psychologists have recognized for years now that the most important image of all that we hold within everyone is the image of ourselves. What image do you hold within you of yourself in your mind's eye? That's the most important determining factor in your life. And virtually every thought, feeling, and action is somehow a result of this self-image that's right here. But again, we don't really see ourselves as we are. We see ourselves according to the images that often others have programmed into us. Like, you're not okay. Thus, if a boss or a friend offers a suggestion to your plan and you have a poor self-image, you might feel criticized and respond negatively toward them. The boss or friend was really just trying to help, but our old stuff gets projected onto their suggestion. Then the suggestion morphs into criticism by your dad or some sibling, and boom, all kinds of negativity gets projected onto them and into your life, and it starts being an, oh, Lord, it's another day kind of day. We do the same thing when we judge people on television, especially politicians, authority figures, and movie stars. They're a great target for our negativity. People were furious when Brad was unfaithful to Jennifer. Remember that? Give some thought to what's really going on in your mind's eye. Try not to give credence to these projections all the time without really looking at them. It can free you of much of your negativity that you have to deal with in your daily life. It's no fun being negative. I'll give you a true example of how ingrained these images are in our mind's eye and why it sometimes takes time to let them go, these self-images. A plastic surgeon once told me about a case where somebody had a terribly disfigured face. He had a bad cleft palate. As a result of this, the individual developed a self-image of feeling very ugly. He'd felt that way since childhood. He went to the plastic surgeon for surgery, and after the surgery and healing, the doctor removed the bandages, placed a mirror in front of his face, and the changes were dramatic, but the patient didn't see any changes. The patient could not see that he did not have a cleft palate anymore. He looked in the mirror and he saw the same ugly face that he felt like he'd had his whole life. The surgeon and the patient's friends couldn't convince him that he looked any different. This kind of reaction isn't uncommon at all. It shows how powerfully these images in our mind can be projected onto the outside world. Now, it might seem kind of like bad news to you that we are all walking around reflecting tapes within our own consciousness and then projecting them out onto the world. But the good news 
is that we each have the power, the absolute power to change those tapes. We can change the images in our consciousness and therefore we can literally choose what we want to see. You have the power to choose your own vision because vision is not out there. It's in here in your consciousness. Not only can we choose, but we do choose every minute of every day. We're always choosing what we see. The choice is usually unconscious and it's habitual, but nonetheless, it's a choice that we are making. So how do we do this? Start choosing differently and thereby dropping some of our negativity that we've been talking about eliminating during Lent. The principle is very simple, though it's not necessarily easy to do. It is this, remind yourself regularly of the unity foundation principle, which is there is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good. That means that everything is God. Thus, we are one with God. God is one with us. We are one with this universal matrix, we all are, of good. That is the foundation teaching of unity. When we can see with that vision that there is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, we can finally get that we are one with universal source. Then we are seeing reality. When we see through the eyes of love, we will see the real world. And that's when negativity just begins to dissipate on its own. We don't even have to work at it. Those of you who have studied Course in Miracles, I see a lot of you out there who have, you've heard this statement before. We have essentially two choices to make every time we choose to see. We can choose to see love or we can choose to see fear. We make the choice. When we see love, we are seeing unity. We are seeing oneness. We are seeing reality. When we choose fear, we are seeing illusion and separation, a world of duality, us and other. Fear sees duality. Fear eyes see the world in terms of good and evil. There are good people and there are evil people. Fear eyes see the world in terms of right and wrong. Usually I'm right and you're wrong. Fear eyes see the world in terms of pleasure and pain. We go through life trying to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Through the eyes of fear, we see this separation. We see conflict, we see attack, and we defend. We see friends and we see enemies. We always see two opposites in conflict with one another. This is the vision of fear. The vision of love is the vision of one. Seeing only love, of seeing everything in terms of love, either love being given or love being needed. We see evil as simply a call for love, a cry for help, a need for us to extend love. When we see only love, we see every individual on earth as giving love or asking for love. And that's what the Course of Miracles calls Christ vision. It's basically knowing that everything is in divine order. When we look with Christ vision, we see that. Remember last week's Bible story about Joseph who was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers? Then in Egypt, he was unjustly thrown into prison. Now, Joseph could have gotten very negative and projected all kinds of unjust, vengeful, and cruel thoughts onto everyone, but he couldn't be bothered. Instead, Joseph forged on with his life and ended up interpreting a dream for Pharaoh that saved Egypt. 
It also resulted in Joseph's becoming second in command under Pharaoh, so that when his brothers and his beloved father journeyed to Egypt from their starving country in search of food, because Egypt was the only country that had any, thanks to Joseph, Joseph was able to save them. The brothers ended up saying, remember, Joseph, we pray for forgiveness for what we did to you years ago. And Joseph answered, I don't need to forgive you. I'm not judging you. I never did. The brothers said, but what we did was so horrible. And Joseph then responded with one of the most beautiful lines in the Bible. He said, you meant evil in what you did to me, but God meant it for good. You see, the whole thing was God's way of saving Joseph and his family from starvation. The metaphysical point is that we often get negative about what we perceive as happening out there, but the reality is that it's all in divine order, ultimately. Joseph didn't waste time with crippling negativity. He trudged on in the divine order of things. He danced with chaos and saved his beloved father, himself, and his family, and created peace. Jesus said, If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If our eye is single, if we see only with Christ's vision, then our body is filled with light, our consciousness is filled with light, and we are transformed. Everything is transformed into good. We become new beings. We function at a whole different level of consciousness, a higher level where everything just turns out right, regardless of how it may seem temporarily at times. This is the Joseph level of consciousness. We no longer see the world through the eyes of fear and anger and duality. And this is how we can eliminate negativity during Lent. We can choose to see things differently through Christ's vision. And this vision is what can eliminate not only negativity, in our personal lives, but in the world. This is a very urgent issue that I believe is necessary to not only look at, but to see. The issue of peace in this great country of ours right now and world peace. I believe that we can have a profound effect in bringing about peace in this country and in the world by holding the vision of the world that we call Christ vision and not projecting our fears and negativity onto everyone and everything. Ask God to give you this vision, not as humans have created it, but the world of peace and love that we can bring onto the physical plane. As above, so below. Or as we say every week, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we do that, there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. There will certainly be peace in our own lives. It's all in the mind's eye. It's choosing to see things differently and not unconsciously. Not seeing bears in the shadows anymore. Our mind's eye can change. In the meantime, think on these things so that you can each day lessen the hold of your projections and see a little more clearly the divine order of things. And so shall it be.